but we are going to be actually finishing chapter 21 today and entering into the last chapter, chapter 22. Um, before I, I get into that, though, I just want to kind of uh, um, recap a little bit from last week. Uh, you know, we're continuing this vision that John has seen, and the, the final portion of the vision that he's seen is actually the new heavens and the new earth and the new Jerusalem. And, and he, saw, he saw them being created, and, and, and he saw the new Jerusalem coming down from heaven. And, um, and so um, verse 9, which is what we concluded with last week, was uh, one of the angels who poured out uh, the wrath of God came to John and said, Come here, I will show you the bride, the wife of the Lamb. And so we are going to uh, we're going to look at the bride, the wife of the lamb, the new Jerusalem today. Um, and I, I just want to remind you guys, I know I say this every week, but I want to remind you guys that that we we are blessed to know and hear this prophecy. Like this is this is something that we don't ordinarily get to have in life, which is the um, the revelation of the future. Right. Ordinarily, we hope for something and we put our hope in what could be, right? But in this particular case, we're not putting our hope in something that could be. We're putting our hope in something that will be. It's a sure thing. And so we are blessed by having this knowledge, this, this revelation. And so let's, uh, let's finish up where we, or let's pick up where we left off. If you guys wouldn't mind standing for the reading of the word of God, we're going to pick up in Revelation chapter 21, starting at verse 10. And this is what it says. And he carried me away in the spirit to a great and high mountain and showed me the holy city, Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, having the glory of God. Her brilliance was like a very costly stone, like a stone of crystal clear jasper. It had a great, high, great and high wall with 12 gates and the gates at the gates, 12 angels. And names were written on them, which were the names of the twelve tribes of the sons of Israel. There were three gates on the east, three gates on the north, three gates on the south, and three gates on the west. And the wall of the city had twelve foundation stones, and on them were the twelve names of the twelve apostles of the Lamb. The one who spoke with me had a gold measuring rod to measure the city and its gates and its wall. The city is laid out as a square, and its length is as great as its width, and he measured the city with the rod 1,500 miles. Its length and width and height are equal. And he measured the wall 72 yards, according to the human measurements, which are also angelic measurements. The material of the wall was jasper, and the city was pure gold, like clear, clear glass. The foundation stones of the city were adorned with every kind of precious stone. The first foundation stone was jasper, the second sapphire, the third chalcedony, the fourth emerald, the fifth sardonyx, the sixth sardis, the seventh chrysolite, the eighth beryl, the ninth topaz, the tenth chrysoprase, the eleventh jacinth, the twelfth amethyst. And the twelve gates were twelve pearls. Each one of the gates was a single pearl. And the street of the city was pure gold, like transparent glass. Let's pray. God, we are in awe of who you are when we read the description of the new Jerusalem. God, you have, you have created this from nothing, just as you created the current heavens and the current earth. You have formed this city, this bride of Christ, uh, and adorned it with gems and jewels. And, and we are just in awe of what you are capable of doing. Even when we think down to the smallest molecule and atom, God, you have formed these things for your glory, God, to express who you are to your people. And so, Lord, I pray that as we study the new Jerusalem and we study what heaven is going to be like, what eternity is going to be like, God, I pray that we would be encouraged. God, I pray that our, strength, our faith would be strengthened. I pray, God, that you would help us to Put our hope not in things that pass away, but in the hope that, that we will spend eternity with you, Lord. And it is a hope that will endure. And so, God, we look forward to 
the new heavens and the new earth. We look forward to eternity with you, and we pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. All right. I know that was a little bit much. I, I usually try to get a little bit of a smaller chunk for our first reading, but I really wanted to get through the description of the New Jerusalem. It's really important that we that we take a look at this. So with the new create with the creation of the new heavens and the new earth, we have we, we see here now that God has an opportunity to create again. And this is not something that he has done since the first creation. He doesn't continue to create things at this point. He, he maintains his creation and, and he operates within it, but he hasn't been expressing that creative side since the creation in Genesis. And that is actually something that we will be looking at in a couple weeks because we're going to be starting our new sermon series in the book of Genesis. And we will be starting at chapter one and we'll be looking at his creative works. But we're seeing now him create again. And he creates this city, right? This is something that's new. He hasn't created a city before. In, in, in previous times, in his previous creation, he created the heavens and the earth, and he created the living creatures that live within him. And, and he, he fashioned and formed a garden, but this city is something new. It is a new thing for him to create. And so if God is capable of creating a city, we're going to see what kind of city he would create. And it makes me think of my daughter who likes to play Minecraft. And she wants to be creative and make things. And it's kind of an expression of that imagination and that creativity. And, and, and there have been things that she's created and, and then she's lost them. And so she's had to start over. And she says, I'm going to create something new. I'm not going to create some, I'm not going to redo what I've lost. I'm not going to go back to that and try to recreate that. No, I'm going to move forward and I'm going to create something new. And I, and I kind of feel like that's something that God has placed within us because it is a reflection of who he is. And he is going to do a new thing. And so he will do this. And, and so now we have this city and this city is for those whose name is written in the Lamb's Book of Life. Just based on the description that we've seen here, we can see and we can tell that this city will be perfect. We can drive through Fresno or through Madera or through the rural areas and, and we will see imperfection, right? We will see death. We will see decay. We will see the the, the process of our current creation taking place around us and, and, and things die. Uh, but that's not something that we're going to be seeing in the new heavens and the new earth and in the new Jerusalem. And it will be beautiful. It will be adorned with perfect, pr um, precious stones. And, and the streets will be made of gold. Gold will be so plentiful that it will be worthless to us, right? If we saw a, if we saw a road full of gold, we would we probably want to like dig it up, right? And be like, hey, now we're rich, right? But in this particular case, the entire city is made of that. The things that we consider to be precious, precious metals and precious stones, will be so plentiful that their value will, will not be considered by us to be meaning anything because we can literally walk on what we consider to be precious today. And it will be so perfect and it will be so pure that what John is saying is that you'll be able to see through it. That is, that is something to behold. I cannot wait to see it. We also see that the city is going to be massive. It's going to be massive. And we'll talk about that in just a second. But I want to back up because John is again carried away in the spirit. He has been carried away in the spirit a couple of times now. And now he is carried away in the spirit to again see something that does not even yet exist. Right? I mentioned that last week. The new heavens and the new earth, they don't exist yet. They'll be replacing the current heavens and the current earth. 
And yet God is capable of revealing the future. He's capable of revealing something that does not even yet exist to John in the spirit. And that, again, should help us remember the power and the capability that God possesses. And so he sees the new Jerusalem coming down out of heaven from God. He, it says that again. Now let's, let's just kind of dive in to the description here a little bit. Um, I, I tried to look up some pictures online to see if there was maybe an artist rendition of the city, but I, I really couldn't find something that I was happy with. Um, and I think mainly the reason why is because we can do our best to imagine what it's going to look like, but we really have no idea, right? I mean, the description that we're given here really is incomprehensible to us. But we are given a description. It is a walled city, and the walls are very high. They're very, uh, very great. Uh, the city is built either in a cube or in a pyramid. I think it's probably going to be the former. It's going to be a cube. But looking at the geometry of it, it could be a pyramid. But it has, uh, it has uh, four sides at the base, and it has three gates at each side, which is probably important considering how long the walls are. And there is an angel at each gate, manning the gate. Each gate was named after a tribe of Israel, which is very interesting. And it's also very important for us to recognize that. And then we also see that each foundation stone of the city had the name, one of the names of the 12 apostles of Christ. Now, the significance is here should be mentioned. Uh, as far as the, the tribes of Israel are concerned, we recognize that God is not done with his people. Right? We've talked about this in the past. We recognize that Israel is still God's chosen people. And it's not because of their faithfulness to him. It's not because they're great. It's not because they're righteous or sinless or whatever. It's because God chose them and made a covenant with their fathers. And God is faithful to uphold that covenant even when they are not faithful to him. And so we see that. We also see that there are the 12 apostles. And there, it is something that's interesting, something that has come up amongst commentators, and maybe you're thinking about it yourself. What about Judas? Well, he was replaced by Matthias, right? And so he became the 12th apostle. And so his name will be on one of the foundation stones. But it is interesting because we we think about the apostles and we think about the great men that they were, but we forget that they were men and they were not flawless. They had their own flaws. In fact, Peter denied Christ as Christ was being uh, condemned. And, and, and he had to flee from the sin that he was faced with. And yet... God used him to do mighty, miraculous things. And he can do the same with us in spite of our own flaws and sin. Now, you may be thinking a couple things. You may be thinking, one, if this is heaven, why does the city have walls, right? Because we think back in the day, the cities had walls for one purpose, and that was for protection. But... They did do something else. They actually established the boundary of the city, and that's what these walls do. There's no need for protection, but these, these walls give boundary to the city. And also, there is one other thing that we may not think about because we live in modern times and we live in unwalled cities. But back in those days, there were people that actually lived or their, their living quarters, their structure was built into the wall. And, and a good example of this is Rahab. Uh, we know that when Israel went to Jericho and they were going to march around the walls of the city 
and, and the spies went in, they, she actually lived, her, her dwelling was actually part of the wall and she was able to let the Jewish spies out of the city through the window of her, of her living quarters that was on the outside of the wall. And so it is entirely possible, especially given the, the description of these walls, it's entirely possible that some of our dwellings, some of our houses, so to speak, will be attached to or incorporated into the walls. Um, I don't know what it's going to look like. I, we, don't, we, we can't know. We can only know what we're told but it is going to be it is going to be interesting and it's going to be different. We also see that there are uh, 12, two sets of 12 things mentioned here. And if you have been with us through the entire time, you may be thinking to yourself, OK, so we have the 12 tribes of Israel and we have the 12 apostles. That makes 24. And we remember back from Revelation chapter four and five and seven and the other chapters that mention the 24 elders, you may be thinking to yourself, well, hey, maybe this is the representative of the 24 elders. Maybe that's who these 24 elders before the throne are. There are certainly commentators and, and, and scholars who want to say that and will teach that. And it is entirely possible that that is the case. It is entirely possible that the, the 24 elders are either representatives or the namesakes of the tribes of Israel and the 12 apostles. But we do need to be careful and not making that assumption um, and, and, and just saying that that is true because the 24 elders' identities are not revealed to us in Scripture. So we do need to make sure that we don't say with certainty that that's who they are but it is entirely possible that that is the case. So let's move forward now. We see that the angel who carried John away, he had, he's replaced the bowl that contained the wrath of God. He's replaced that now with a golden measuring rod. And in those times, those were uh, reeds. We talked about this back in when we discussed Nehemiah. And then we also talked about it again in Revelation 11. There was a measuring rod and uh, and if you guys remember, that rod was, it used to be a reed, and they would cut it to length because the reeds would grow very tall. They would cut it to length, and then they would use that end over end to measure, right? Now, this particular rod was not a reed, as we see here in antiquity, but this was made of gold. And, uh, and so we actually know that it was, um, it was capable of measuring uh, a, a measurement called stadia, which we don't really use anymore. Uh, it's it's kind of anti uh, it's a measurement of antiquity, but that is the Greek word that is used here in Revelation to to measure out the distance. And uh, a stadia is a little bit over 600 feet, and so we are seeing that this measurement equals to roughly 1,500 miles. And this is this is quite something. I don't know if you guys can wrap your brains around 1,500 miles. Um, this actually is, um, the city is actually a cube of 1,500 miles on each side. So you have its length, its width, and its height, all 1,500 miles. That's what it says in there. It says that each side is equal to one another. And so what this translates into is approximately 1.9 million square miles, if it's a cube, right? And, and so I actually, we, I have a picture that I want to show you guys, uh, but I just want to give you guys an idea that this could actually fit inside the, the country, the continent of Australia. Um, it, it's not quite as big as Australia, but it's bigger than the nation of India. So if you guys can think about India on the map, the New Jerusalem is going to be bigger than the country of India. Uh, and so to put it here in local perspective, we can kind of see this picture. 
Um, I found this on on the internet. Um, it's it's kind of showing. It's kind of a funky uh, detail, but you can mostly see what's happening, right? You can mostly see that the New Jerusalem would fill up the vast majority of the continental United States. Uh, to put it into perspective for us, if we left the ranchos and we drove for 1,500 miles, we might find ourselves arrived in Dallas, Texas. So that's about 1,500 miles, right? So that gives us a little bit of an idea of what that is. But we also recognize that not only is its length and its width 1,500 miles each, but also its height, right? That's a cube. Its height is also 1,500 miles. Now, I don't know about you guys, but I didn't really think about it before doing this study. But having studied Revelation, I remembered that this is a significant distance. Um, Mount Everest is about five and a half miles tall from sea level. So I just want you guys to wrap your brains around that. Mount Everest, which is the tallest mountain, it's the tallest peak above sea level on Earth. It's about five and a half miles. Uh, just to give you another frame of reference, the International Space Station, which I'm sure you guys have heard of, it orbits, it, it orbits the Earth about 240 miles above the Earth. Right, so just wrap your brains around that for a moment. The space station orbits the Earth at about 240 miles above sea level. If we were to fit the New Jerusalem on the Earth, it would still be within the gravitational atmosphere of the Earth, but it would be much significantly further out um, into, I had to look it up, it's, it's out into the exosphere, right? It's, it's where, it's where the, the, the gravity has no effect on, on most things. The, the temperature is static and, and negative, and, um, and there, there's no oxygen, but the gravitational pull still creates some atmosphere out to that distance and even beyond that. Uh, but it is quite interesting. It is quite interesting. 1,500 miles. So what does that tell us about the New Jerusalem? It tells us that it's going to be different than anything we have ever experienced. We're not going to have to worry about altitude sickness, right? Because if you go to Mount Everest right now, you need to bring a respirator. Most people need to bring some kind of breathing apparatus just to just to climb part of all the way part way to it, let alone all the way to the peak, right? because the air is so thin there. The new heavens and the new earth and the new Jerusalem are going to be so different than what we have ever experienced. It really is unimaginable. It really is. And so we also, uh, I also want to mention something to you guys. The reason also why I think it's going to be a cube rather than a pyramid is because in Solomon's temple, the first temple that was made, the Holy of Holies was designed to be a perfect cube. And the Holy of Holies was where the Ark of the Covenant rested. It was where God's throne was among his people. And it was designed to be a perfect cube. Its length, its width, its height was all the same. And so I do believe that this was a shadow of God's eternal throne with us in the New Jerusalem. And we will, we will talk about that um, in just a moment. Now, we also see the walls of Jerusalem were measured. And, and it's, it's kind of funny in the English translation. It doesn't make a lot of sense to us because we're like, well, I thought the, the walls were already measured, right? They're supposed to be the same height as the rest of the, the length and the width of the city. It actually says that the walls of Jerusalem are going to be 72 yards thick. That's what's being measured. 72 yards thick. So we're almost a third, or excuse me, we're three quarters, almost a three quarters of a football field. Thick walls. 
Just, just try to wrap your brain around that, right? We don't have a structure now today that is 72 yards thick other than maybe a dam. When they, when they build dams, hydroelectric dams, and they stop these huge gorges up, they're pretty thick, pretty thick. Um, but this is going to be bigger than anything we can ever imagine, anything that we can ever imagine. Um, and, and we also see that the gates were made of giant pearls. It actually says that each gate is one pearl, one giant pearl. Now, I don't know how big the gates are. We don't, we don't know how big the gates are. But we do know that pearls, you know, they're usually pretty small, right? Uh, I actually did a little research and I, and I learned that pearls can actually continue to grow as, as big as the clam makes it. If the, if the clam is a giant clam, the pearl that it can make can be huge. And, 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 and so we recognize that if that's the case, and pearls can vary in size and they can be made to be large, then that means God can just make a pearl as big as he wants it to be, right? He can be 12 feet tall if he really wanted it to be. But that's what the gate is made of. It's made from one pearl and each gate, and there's 12 gates. And it may seem a little funny that there's 12 gates, but we also have to remember that each wall is 1,500 miles. So that means that you're looking at, you know, every 300 miles or so, you've got a gate. 300 miles is a long way. So you've got... Um, so you, you've you've got these you've got these gates and these massive walls and this just immense city, and it's coming down from heaven, from God, to the new earth. We, there's there's nothing in existence that can be like this. There's nothing that we can even remotely compare to what the new Jerusalem is going to be like. But it keeps going. The description keeps going in Revelation. We're going to pick up where we left off. And in verse 22, it says this. John says, I saw no temple in it, for the Lord God, the Almighty, and the Lamb are its temple. And the city has no need of the sun or of the moon to shine on it, for the glory of God has illuminated it, and its lamp is the Lamb. The nations will walk by its light, and the kings of the earth will bring their glory into it. In the daytime, for there will be no night there, its gates will never be closed, and they will bring the glory and the honor of the nations into it. And nothing unclean, and no one who practices abomination and lying shall ever come into it, but only those whose names are written in the Lamb's book of life. So now we're seeing a little bit further description. We'll see the rest of the description in just a moment, but we, we're getting new information here. But this is actually not new to us because we've seen this before. We've seen that there is no temple because there's no need for a temple. God himself will be in the midst of his people. The temple represented a place where worship and sacrifice was to be made. It was to be the throne, so to speak, of heaven, the presence of God within, within the, the, his people. And, and now it has been replaced because it is no longer necessary. I have a, a couple cross-references here. In Hebrews chapter 9, the author of Hebrews is talking about how the priests and the, and the temple went about their business and and what they did and the regular sacrifices and the washings and the ceremonial stuff that they did. And he talks about everything that was done and, and, and how what the high priest would go into the Holy of Holies once a year and he would bring blood with him so that he could offer sacrifice for the sins of the people. But we learned that the blood of bulls and goats is meaningless and worthless to pay for that sin. And then we see in verse 11, 
But when Christ appeared as a high priest of the good things to come, he entered through the greater and more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands, that is to say, not of this creation, and not through the blood of goats and calves, but through his own blood, he entered the holy place once for all, having obtained eternal redemption. What Christ did allowed us to once again enter into the presence of God. Now, we can't do that here in our mortal bodies. We would die if we did that. But in our immortal, imperishable, resurrected bodies, we will be capable of being in his presence. You see, in John chapter 4, Jesus is talking to the woman at the well. And they've been having this dialogue about living water. And we're going to actually get back to that in just a moment. But he's talking to her and she says to him in verse 20, Our fathers worshipped in this mountain. And you people say that in Jerusalem is the place where men ought to worship. Jesus said to her, Woman, believe me, an hour is coming when neither in this mountain nor in Jerusalem, Jerusalem will you worship the Father. You worship what you do not know. We worship what we know, for salvation is from the Jews. But an hour is coming, and now is, when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. For such people the Father seeks to be his worshipers. God is spirit. And those who worship him must worship in spirit and truth. In other words, it doesn't matter the location where worship takes place now at this point. This is not Jerusalem. This is not the Mount, uh, the Mount Zion. We're not in a holy place, so to speak. But where we are, we worship in spirit and in truth. And that is something that will continue to occur into eternity as we are with him in his presence. We also see that the new Jerusalem will be illuminated by the glory of God. It says that there will no longer be need for the sun and moon because God will give off its light. It, this is very interesting because in the first heavens and the first earth, it actually details the creation of the sun, moon, and stars in Genesis chapter 1, verses 14 through 18. This is what it says. It says, Then God said, Let there be lights in the expanse of the heavens to separate the day from night, and let them be for signs and for seasons and for days and years. And let them be for lights in the expanse of the heavens to give light on the earth. And it was so. God made two great lights, the greater light to govern the day and the lesser light to govern the night. And he made the stars also. God placed them in the expanse of the heavens to give light on the earth and to govern the day and the night and so to separate the light from the darkness. And God saw that it was good. Now we're going to go over that in a few weeks, but but I want, I want you to see the purpose behind why God created the sun, moon, and stars. And it was to give light. And it was to govern day and night. There was a distinguishing of those things. And yet now we see here that in the new heavens and the new earth, there will be no night. And there will always be light because there will always be the presence of God. The first heavens and the first earth, the first sun and moon and stars, they will all pass away. They will all be destroyed, as we saw in chapter 20. He will not recreate them for the new heavens and the new earth. We see this in Isaiah chapter 60, verses 19 and 20. It says this, No longer will you have the sun for light by day, nor the brightness will, will the moon give you light. But you will have the Lord for an everlasting light and your God for your glory. Your sun will no longer set 
nor will your moon wane, for you will have the Lord for an everlasting light, and the days of your mourning will be over. This is, this is encouraging, and it's fascinating, because we don't understand the creation without the sun and the moon and the stars. In fact, those are a few of the most constant things we can have in this life, right? We can say with certainty that the sun will rise tomorrow morning and the moon will come up and it will govern the night. It will, it will give light during the darkness of the night and the stars will shine and we can look up into the heavens and see them in the nighttime. It is, it is one of those things that we take for granted because the sun will always rise. And yet, in the new heavens and the new earth, there will be a new reality. There will be a new constant. And it will not be the rising and the setting of the sun. It will be God in our midst. It also mentions here that the nations will walk by the light of Jerusalem and that the lamp of Jerusalem will be the Lamb. And this is very fitting to see this because Jesus himself said that he is the light of the world, right? He, he shows and shines his light into the darkness. And John chapter 1 says that we beheld his light, but the world loved the darkness and craved that instead. And yet it did not cease from Jesus being the light of the world. And so he continues to be the lamp. Now the nations, you may be, you may be reading this and saying, wait, what do you mean nations, right? I thought this was the new heavens and the new earth. The word here in, in the Greek is ethnos, which is the same word that we see repeated over and over again in the New Testament. And this Greek word can mean nations, it can mean peoples, but it can also mean Gentiles. And in fact, the vast majority of the uses of this word is Gentiles. And so what we're seeing here is that the Gentiles will walk into the New Jerusalem and they will walk in the light of the New Jerusalem. And so it is the Gentiles who come in, and it says nothing of them leaving. It only says that they will come into the new Jerusalem, and they will bring with them the glory that they have. It will bring with them the riches and the splendor that they have. And so, in my opinion, I, this seems to be a fulfillment of what we see in the New Testament, the mystery of God. It says in Ephesians chapter 3 verses 4 through 6, Paul is talking to the Ephesians about the mystery of God, how it has been revealed to him. And we see this in verse 4. By referring to this, when you read, you can understand my insight into the mystery of Christ, which in other generations was not made known to the sons of men as it has now been revealed to his holy apostles and prophets in the spirit. To be specific, and this is the mystery, that the Gentiles are fellow heirs and fellow members of the body and fellow partakers of the promise in Christ Jesus through the gospel. We recognize in the Old Testament that it's the Jews who will inherit eternal life, right? It is the Jews who will be in God's presence. It is the Jews who are God's chosen people. But what we're seeing here now that the mystery of Christ is that Gentiles are going to be fellow heirs. They will inherit eternal life. They will inherit eternity. And I don't know about you, but for me, that is great news because I am not a Jew. I am a Gentile. And so it will be me who inherits that. It will be you, if you are not a Jew, you will inherit eternal life that was originally meant for the Jews. This is the mystery of the gospel. 
Only those whose name is written in the Lamb's book of life will be able to enter into the new Jerusalem. We see this in Revelation. It says those who commit unrighteousness will suffer the second death, the lake of fire. We talked about this last week. We will continue to talk about it. I'll go more into detail next week because we don't have the time today, but we will talk about this. But it does say that those who commit and practice unrighteousness will suffer the second death, the lake of fire. We will identify what exactly that means. Because we all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. But there is something that sets those apart who are written in the Lamb's book of life. This fate can be escaped by placing our faith in Christ. Otherwise, we will be judged for our deeds. Now, let's finish up. Our, our section, our, our, our section in scripture, we're actually going to get into chapter 22 today. We're going to read the first five verses in Revelation 22, and it says this. Then he, the angel, showed me a river of the water of life, crystal, clear as crystal, coming from the throne of God and from, excuse me, from the throne of God and of the Lamb in the middle of its streets. On either side of the river was the tree of life, bearing 12 kinds of fruit, yielding its fruit every month. And the leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. There will no longer be any curse. And the throne of God and of the Lamb will be in it, and his bondservants will serve him. They will see his face, and his name will be on their foreheads, and there will, be, there will no longer be any night. And they will not have a need of the light of a lamp nor of the light of the sun because the Lord God will illuminate them and they will reign forever and ever. There's some fascinating things taking place here. The first thing we see is the river of life flowing from the throne down the middle of the city. That means this is a massive river. Right? It's massive because the city itself is massive. That means this river must be massive. And yet it is fitting to, to see and to read this because we know of Christ being the water of life. In fact, we were just talking about that section in Scripture, in John chapter 4. Starting at verse 10, we actually see Christ talking about this. It says, Jesus answered her and said to her, if you knew the gift of God, and who, excuse me, who it is who says to you, give me a drink, you would have asked him, and he would have given you living water. She said to him, sir, you have nothing to draw with, and the well is deep. Where do you get this living water? You are not greater than our father Jacob, are you, who gave us the well and drank of it himself and the sons, his sons and his cattle? Jesus answered and said to her, everyone who drinks of this water will thirst again. But whoever drinks of the water that I will give him shall never thirst. But the water that I will give him will become in him a well of water springing up to eternal life. This is Christ speaking of the water of life. And again, if we jump to, to chapter 7, Jesus again declares this in chapter 7, starting at verse 37. It says, Now on the last day, the great day of the feast, Jesus stood and cried out, saying, If anyone is thirsty, let him come to me and drink. He who believes in me, as the scripture says, from his innermost being will flow rivers of living water. But this he spoke of the Spirit, whom those who believed in him were to receive. For the Spirit was not yet given because Jesus was not yet glorified. And so we see that the Spirit of God is going to be flowing through the midst of the city. And we also see that this river that runs through the middle on either side of the river will be the tree of life. There are various artist renditions of this and 
and renderings of it. It could be 12 different trees that are all one tree. It could be the roots growing up and over and meeting in the middle. We don't know what it's going to look like, but it will be the tree of life. We actually see here in scripture that um, it says that it will bear tw 12 kinds of fruit. The, the Greek actually renders it a little bit differently, but it's, it's hard to translate into English. It could be 12 different crops. It could be 12 different groups of crops. It could be 12 different kinds of crops. We don't, we don't know, but the way that it's rendered is, is fine. We do see that it will be rendered every month. Every month we will have a harvest of fruit from the tree of life. And we remember from Genesis that the tree of life would make Adam and Eve like God in the sense that they would not die. And so this tree is something that we will eat from in heaven. We also see that its leaves give healing to the nations who come into Jerusalem. And uh, this may be interesting to you. It may be a little different, but, but this is actually not far from the heart of Scripture because we see it in Ezekiel chapter 47. Uh, we see it in verses 1 and 2 and then again in verse 12, but this is what it says. Ezekiel says, Then he brought me back to the door of the house, and behold, water was flowing from under the threshold of the door toward the east, for the house faced east. And the water was flowing down from under, from the right side of the house, from south of the altar. He brought me out by way of the north gate and led me around on the outside of the outer gate by the way of the gate that faces east. And behold, water was trickling from the south side. Now, the house that he's referring to is actually the temple of God. And water is flowing from the altar in the temple. Now, if we jump down to verse 12, this is what it says. By the river on its banks... And on one side and on the other will grow all kinds of trees for food. Their leaves will not wither and their fruit will not fail. They will bear every month because their water flows from the sanctuary and their fruit will be food, will be for food and their leaves for healing. This is a vision that Ezekiel was given in his lifetime of what would take place, but the vision that he sees here is actually what we're seeing in the New Jerusalem. That water will be flowing from the altar, from the throne of God, and there will be the trees bearing their fruit and the leaves which bring healing. And it is fitting that it is the tree that the nations receive healing from. We see in 1 Peter Chapter 2, he, Peter talks about this. In, in chapter 2, starting at verse 21, it says, For you have been called for this purpose, since Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example for you to follow in his steps. Who committed no sin, nor was any deceit found in his mouth, and while being reviled, he did not revile in return. While suffering, he uttered no threats, but kept entrusting himself to him who judges righteously. And he himself bore our sins in his body on the cross so that we, may, we might die to sin and live to righteousness, for by his wounds you were healed. And so it is fitting that we receive healing from the, from the tree of life. It is a tree that Jesus hung on, and it is his blood that he shed to give us true healing and give us an opportunity to repent. And finally, we see that the curse will be gone. There will no longer be any curse. And this was the reason why God removed access to the tree of life in the Garden of Eden because of the curse of Adam and Eve. The curse will be gone now. And so now we will have access to the tree of life. 
I just want to repeat a couple of things that I said last week to help us apply what we're reading. The, the new Jerusalem, the new heavens and the new earth may, may be hard for us to fathom and to grasp, but there are things that we can understand from these scriptures that we've read. The first thing we can know is that salvation that Christ offers gives us freedom in this life from the worry of eternity. We can know with certainty what will take place in the future, and we can know with certainty where we will be spending eternity. It is the hope that we have in Christ that sets us free in this life. And, and also, not only is this hope etern of eternity what sets us free, but it is this heaven that we are longing for. It is the country that we belong to. And it is the country that we will go home to. This is a sure thing. This is more sure than the rising and the setting of the sun because one day that will cease. But this is sure. This is certain. And if we put our hope in this, we will not be disappointed. 